Hi, this is Steve Carlson. I'm coming here, uh, coming to you here from uh, Rice Park is behind me. Uh, we have the big Christmas tree there, beautiful Christmas tree. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. The time that the uh, Maccabees fought off the conquering Romans and helped to defend the faith. And then Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, I cannot be bell ringing today, but I'd like to keep I'd like everybody to keep in mind the body of Christ at this time of year to uh, care for them and help them and help us all become one. And what this is is a response to uh, for the election contest to submissions filed by Al Franken and his uh, two Washington attorneys, one here in Minneapolis and by the, uh, the Attorney General on behalf of the Secretary of State Mark Ritchie, the other contestee, and I want to answer some of the uh, claims that uh, they've come up with. Uh, this is part one of an actual response which will be submitted to them and to the court. In response to the requests that this case be dismissed and distorting the contest uh, in order once again to attempt to urge a Minnesota court to break the law and constitution in order to discredit a campaign, mine, with a major political party an independent person is nominee of the Independence Party that articulates a powerful vision of leadership far superior to the weak positions and tentative expressions of a first-term candidate seeking to escape a national tidal wave of opposition. I, as a contestant, provide this response. To clarify these points for the United States Senate and United States Supreme Court, uh, to whom this contest will be reported, it will be brought to the United States Senate, and who has already received the Supreme Court part of this case, albeit for some reason late. I urge this panel to follow Minnesota election law as it has been established by the Minnesota legislature and to allow me to present evidence, including direct testimony from the contestees themselves, Al Franken and Mark Ritchie, to show what the law is and how it was trampled, rejected, and abandoned. And this includes the DFL's efforts, and it includes Minnesota courts themselves, who fashioned startling refusals to intervene. This began in a safe DFL district, Ramsey County District Court, when I filed a timely contest trying to get these issues before the U.S. House of Representatives in 2012, before Representative McCollum would be seated. The ideas of res judicata are yet another attempt to discredit me and my campaign, especially pretending to uh, create a salient issue that I am somehow a uh, serial litigator, and I'm kind of jumping pages here, I ask for your patience here, uh, a serial litigator, uh, because I am demanding that the Minnesota election laws once established, once established and not, may not be abandoned during election and contest periods, but strictly and faithfully honored and adhered to. This includes a role for the Minnesota judiciary. Before the election takes place is called the remedial petition and after the election contest. None of the issues which the Secretary uh, of State Mark Ritchie initiated by surprisingly in 2012 violating a long-standing practice of Nancy Bream, his employee, in the elections office to make available the public information voter email addresses to all candidates and not just to me. And Mark all of a sudden pretended this was now illegal. So uh, none of these issues have been resolved by any Minnesota state court. And I will get into what they are at that time uh, when Mark Ritchie did this, I tried filing a federal lawsuit and a temporary restraining order to get the voter email addresses and challenge the unconstitutional uh, voter, uh, Minnesota voter quotas, which is another issue. The uh, DFL is Minnesota voter quotas based on gender, race, and sexual practices. Uh, and I actually filed that in a matter of days, although I am not an attorney. When the federal court refused to act, didn't even provide me a summons until uh, the day he rejected uh, the motion, I was left with no recourse but to initiate a contest, which was filed and received timely in the Ramsey County District Court in St. Paul, but the DFL district officials made up a requirement which does not exist and refused to proceed, and the office of Mark Ritchie and the Attorney General 
Instead of enforcing the election law, unlawfully forwarded Betty McCollum's election certificate to Washington while the contest was pending, blocked and unresolved. This is obviously not a case which could be binding in terms of adjudicating the issues I raise here now, even though they remain the same for a second election. With the addition of the debate issue, Al Franken's invitation only debates, in the middle of the 2014 election, uh, forcing me to seek a remedy to that total blackout. Voters do not want candidates uh, or courts to idly accept this kind of abuse of the First Amendment in violation of the Senate's requirements. The Minnesota Supreme Court refused to consider the very same issue addressed uh, in, in, in this very court. Okay, it was addressed and adjudicated in this very Ramsey County Court where this three-judge panel is being convened. Uh, but in this case, it was for a single last-minute debate in 2002 and not an entire season of debates as Al Franken uh, uh, arranged. And that was in James Moore versus Minnesota Public Radio, court file number C2-010548. Uh, uh, then the IP nominee in 2002, uh, like that, I too have a right in 2014, even a duty to fight back against the rich and powerful duopoly of the DFL and the Minnesota GOP, who try to own the government as an entitlement. And this is the only way to restore democracy as it was envisioned by our founders and framers. They even arranged the uh, contestees uh, in, in the Franken camp uh, to have me disowned while, and also the GOP while they secured the quote-unquote endorsement of two former Independence Party members. That's included as Exhibit B. I realize that technology and money and direct elections and a lot more have transformed our federal elections process since 1789. But the fundamentals remain the same. This body, in passing the Communications Act of 1935 and its equal time requirement, tried to keep those fundamentals intact, to guard against one party in a state or locality eliminating the competition through mass media propaganda and exclusion of other information, uh, much as you now struggle with the safe seat redistricting problem in the House of Representatives. How can this Congress and the nation restore competition of ideas, break gridlock and hyperpartisanship, to constantly renew and revitalize this representative government through direct elections, uh, so that this body cannot become a mere appendage to a growing executive which incumbents, with incumbents willing to disregard this body and create a new order using the executive order? And Senator Franken has supported this 97% of the time and continues. And that was an issue raised in the campaign against him. But alternative ideas were limited and eliminated by inter alia domination of mass media propaganda through massive permeation of 30 second sound bites and exclusive publicly broadcast so called U.S. Senate debates, which, however, did not include the major political party nominees who had won major political party primaries, as I did. And this representative democracy simply cannot work in this manner. And it is not working and must be contested. And I must contest it. So there has been litigation in the federal court. And I did point out to Judge Michael Davis that I was going to continue running in 2014 since the Independence Party presents a wonderful portal through which to access the general election ballot and intend to run for federal office again in 2016. So these fundamental and constitutional issues needed to be resolved for future elections and were not moved. And so the judge took down everything said by Nathan Hartshorn, who has consistently urged Minnesota courts not to follow election law and now urges that this state court exclude these issues from the United States Senate resolution. And both contestees urge these matters do not rise to anything the U.S. Senate could be interested in in evaluating this election and determining whether to seat or whether to exclude Senator Franken based on that election. And Judge Davis more or less restated back on paper the wishes and words of Secretary Ritchie and Attorney General Swanson through Hartshorn in his opinions. 
there's been no comment added by the Eighth Circuit. What, is not, what was not done was resolving these issues. What it does is create a record cited by contestees, and it will be the subject of a petition for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court by Christmas because a timely filed petition for rehearing to the Eighth Circuit during the election was denied September 25, 2014. So this does not stand as appropriate final legal answers. However, the point here is not what do the courts say. It is what would the U.S. Senate say about Senator Franken's and his party's manner of laying waste to our democratic elections, this cynical manipulation of the machinery of elections and mass media propaganda to vitiate and dispirit the voters and discourage them from participating. 58% of voters nationally want a third major political party, and we have one in Minnesota, and we're letting Senator Franken and his party destroy it with little real opposition from the Republicans who excommunicated nearly 20 people in 2010 when the IP party was blamed for Tom Emmer, now U.S. Representative, uh, replacing Michelle Bachman, uh, losing the governor's race uh, when Tom Horner, IP's Tom Horner, took 12% of the vote. I believe Mr. Horner was one who was excommunicated by the GOP chair, Tony Sutton. But it seems in this election, Mr. Horner was back in good graces, working for Mike McFadden. The IP is indeed a gutsy party, responding to a strong call for a vehicle for independent voters, but not because of issue positions it takes, but because it gets torn apart from election to election uh, by the uh, duopoly uh, by between the parties having um, boldly reached, the IP did, toward the sky of freedom and independence in 1992 when the crazy Ross Perot uh, ran for president, got 19% of the vote. But Pat Buchanan was just uh, too much and the National Party affiliation was severed, leaving it to lurch from party to party, election to election. Uh, Democrat candidate uh, Jim Graves was the one who approached the party in 2012 to push homosexual marriage. Now, just to address the first contention of Senator Franken, uh, his defense that his vote total is insurmountable. Senator Franken thinks it's absurd that anyone could allege that they could beat his vote total. And that's with record spending and utterly excluding a major party candidate based on his own negotiations, Franken and McFadden, with the GOP to make himself look good. As if no one could ever challenge him on his level of issues. He only allowed a political novice, Mike McFadden, to stand next to him in the general election. And then only toward the end of the contest, beginning one month before the vote, and preceded by massive spending on attack ads on McFadden. Obviously, if I would have been able to expose his weaknesses, as I did on YouTube and Twitter in the primaries to defeat the IP endorsed Senate candidate, the gap with McFadden could have closed quickly. I would have debated McFadden on day one and asked Keith Downey if I could do that. And this could have been a three-candidate race. I polled 13% against him, that being Franken, July 2nd, 2014 on Gravis Marketing. And I was not even listed as the endorsed candidate for the IP at that time. That's some of the politics. But more importantly, Senator Franken left two million votes on the table. Only 50% of the eligible vote voters bother to come out, the lowest in five election cycles. It didn't help that he perfected the Zen art of being completely boring, see Exhibit A. I alleged that all this suppression, evasion, and corruption was designed by Senator Frank and his party in Minnesota, including Mark Ritchie as the state's chief elections officer, and his campaign to make his small level of support carry him through and to avoid a nasty challenge like he got from the Coleman campaign in 2008. Senator Franken was joined in this strategy by the DFL governor candidate, Mark Dayton, incumbent, who also delayed debates, and the press opined this is fitting for an incumbent, and then finally did appear on October 1st, the same day as Franken's first debate, by invitation only, uh, with Mike McFadden in Duluth. And Dayton chose to appear with the IP candidate Hannah Nicollet on the debate stage, 
to soften the harder attack from the GOP's political threat, Jeff Johnson, a fairly well-known Hennepin County Commissioner. This is an example of the way the candidates during elections in Minnesota toy with this, uh, this body's equal time requirements in the Communication Act reference supra. Neither the equal time provisions nor the First Amendment, which this body helped to fashion and Senator Franken hopes to fashion further, obviously this is of concern to this body, the U.S. Senate, that a state is running amok of the U.S. Constitution's and this body's regulation of the manner in which federal elections are executed once the state's elections laws are fixed before the election starts. As Justice Miller said in Yarborough, it's part of Yarborough, if this government is anything more than a mere aggregation of delegated agents of other states and governments, each of which is superior to the general government, it, the federal government, must have the power to protect the elections on which its existence depends from violence and corruption. If it has not this power, it is left helpless before the two great natural and historical enemies of all republics, open violence and insidious corruption. This applies as surely in evaluating the tactics of Senator Franken as did the state of Georgia in the 1884 case. Yet, with all this political assault on the Constitution, federal election law, and the Independence Party, and the campaign its elected nominee in opposition, myself, Senator Franken polled only 25% of eligible voters, leaving 2 million votes on the table. And my contention is that if he did not have a complete annihilation of my First Amendment rights during the general election, including stopping every kind of free media, he could. I did create about 130 YouTube videos at uh, my account uh, and distributed them to all Minnesota and many national Twitter feeds from a list I created to reach uh, Minnesota voters with links to my website, but I could have, if allowed, leveraged this successful strategy with broadcasts and recordings of my debates with him, Senator Franken, to challenge him face to face and show him that I was a more formidable debater than the political novice he led on the stage with him. Had I had the same treatment he had and that he and his DFL party bought, he would have faded. He would have been challenged. He would have faced opposition from me that was robust, uninhibited, and wide open. I want to be very clear here. It is the invalidity of the election and Senator Franken's campaign that I show here. I am not continuing all the political issue debates, which were very real, if not allowed to see the light of day. Cradle to grave, wall to wall attacks on any ability to get in front of the voters in an environment where his friends and surrogates carried out a campaign of vicious lies and designed distortions, which I could never answer except by YouTube videos and tweets on Twitter. In a series of tweets to him, to Tom Sheck of NPR, who penned The Poison, and Brian Bax of Associated Press who would never mention me except big headlines announcing I had supposedly been disowned by the independent voters who elected me nominee. They listed false issue positions attributed to me as the cause of the supposed disowning, and after that mentioned only in the last lines of articles announcing Senator Franken's debates by invitation only, that I was not invited to Al's debates, which were nonetheless billed and promoted as the U.S. Senate debates. This is Exhibit C. There is more to judging elections than vote count. When we send distinguished delegations to monitor elections around the world, we look at many things that all concern this body. Saddam Hussein got a lot of votes. Hosni Mubarak got a lot of votes. Most dictators get a lot of votes. Fidel Castro describes what he calls a nation that is a democracy or has de democratic features. Speaking of Cuba, he says, we are speaking of democracy. If government is of people and democratic people can be consulted uh, as we are doing here. What is more an example of pure democracy than meetings such as this one? If they cannot call such meetings, uh, they are not democracies. Those who want to see uh, people's uh, democracy, let them come here to Cuba and see this. We can speak to America and the world because we speak in names of a whole nation. This is from Wikipedia. But our system, America, wasn't supposed to work this way. 
And the Constitution, not regulators, in the Federal Communications Commission, as Senator Franken and his DFL and the Minnesota courts have relied on, to, uh, rely, uh, to, to redefine the rights of political uh, freedom of political speech and association. Here, uh, the Constitution guards First Amendment rights during the heat of an election. This is America. This kind of Senate election and Senate candidate debate is frustrating the intent of the Supreme Court expressed in, in Ray Yarbrough. Senator Franken's attorneys, that is to say those helping him through the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, insist that the case Yarbrough speaks for itself, but it doesn't speak to anyone who isn't listening and won't comment. So let me be absolutely clear in what it says. that The right to vote is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 4, not in the First Amendment. Contestee has not answered this, or they have not answered this, and they must admit it is true. But the First Amendment is something which this distinguished body, the U.S. Senate, has created in order to protect and enforce that right to vote, which requires voters being aware and informed of the issues, as I argue throughout this answer. And therefore, Yarbrough cannot be so easily brushed aside. How in these practices of establishing quotas of cadres tantamount to the women's party, minorities' parties, homosexuals' party, to be included in what is supposed to be a free and open association of all the voters who want to be DFL, where there are individual rights, not group rights or special uh, interest rights in, in the U.S. Constitution, or where the official resources here the the email addresses in the possession of Mark Ritchie in the office of Secretary of State Mark Ritchie can be used, and Senator Franken can use his official resources, including emails, uh, within the ex uh, ethics rule of the Senate, that is to say liberally, to promote the DFL campaigns. But they can totally quash and annihilate the resources, including free media, of a nominee of a Minnesota major political party who is opposing Senator Franken. Can we then say the First Amendment and other regulations like equal time are protecting and enforcing that right to vote? Under Minnesota's elections laws, it has been clearly stated that the right to regulate is coexistent with the right to enforce, that one cannot take a seat unless they have gained that seat through a valid election. The court, uh, this is citing from Pavlak versus Groh, 1979. The court in Sari v. Gleason from 1914 logically and emphatically ruled that the power to promote fair elections necessarily implies the power to set aside unfair elections. Uh, italics added, uh, of course, for this race, that could only be done by the Congress. However, the Minnesota courts or the Senate or U.S. Supreme Court could restore the IP status based on this contest, and I'm going to ask that motions to that effect uh, be allowed in this contest after the issue of Franken's uh, exclusion is decided. And they go on, as of what use would it be to assess a misdemeanor penalty against the offender of an election law while allowing him to hold the office obtained in part by his very violation? An offender or offender party may not reap the be benefit of his wrong, and unfair elections must therefore be set aside. It is a recognition of the oldest requirement for democratic office of all, the, of all that the candidate must have prevailed in a valid election. If he has not done so, he may not sit." Unquote. This is from 1914 case, establishing precedent for Minnesota election law. Now the lawyers say it speaks for itself. What it says for this election contest is that same emphatic, compelling, logical step, that the power to promote fair elections, as this august body, the United States Senate, does reserve our democratic representative form of federal government, implies the power to set aside unfair elections. I ask that you carry it out. And to the Minnesota courts and Minnesota chief elections office, I ask that you allow the Senate to evaluate this request without interposing other sets of judges to block this critical democratic freedom. So we will have uh, less a government with democratic features and more a people's democracy for this and future elections. I have read Justice Scalia's opinion in Stephen Morgan versus United States of America, D.C. Circuit 1986. 
and it speaks to the supposed issues and defenses raised by contestees to prevent this proceeding. To quote, as Chancellor Kent expressed it, as each house acts in these cases of judging the election return and qualifications of its members in a judicial character, its decisions, like the decisions of any other court of justice, ought to be regulated by known principles of law and strictly adhered to for the sake of uniformity and certainty. Exactly my argument in this case. That's from Kent's commentaries. And Justice Scalia goes on. As far as we are aware, in none of the discussions of the clause did there appear a trace of suggestion that the power it conferred was not exclusive and final. Obviously, the Supreme Court will not have the power to set aside this election of Senator Franken, but the U.S. Senate will. And what Justice Scalia was saying in Morgan is that once that body took up an election in Indiana, which was very much like Franken versus Coleman in 2008, and makes it, made its decision regarding its own ex, uh, organization and membership on January 3rd or after, under Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution, any further judicial challenge is moot. But not only that, not only after they do that, but right now, under the same constitutional provision, neither this court nor any other in the state can take the place of the U.S. Senate as the sole judge. And to quote again, it is difficult to imagine a clear case of textually demonstrable con constitutional um, commitment of an issue to another branch of government to the exclusion of the courts, uh, see Baker versus Carr, 1962, then the language of Article 1, Section 5, Clause 1, that, quote, each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns and qualifications of its own members, unquote. The provision states not merely that each house may judge these matters, this is quoting Scalia again, but that each house shall be the judge, emphasis added. The exclusion of others, and in particular of others who are judges, could not be more evident. This is identical at six from the Morgan case. So to the panel of Ramsey County judges appointed by the Minnesota Supreme Court under Chapter 209 Minnesota Statutes, do not try to be the judge of this election. Do not set up judges like Elena Ostby in 2012 uh, seeking to be included as the judge and blocking the contest when the Supreme Court has already clearly ruled and textually demonstrably committed this issue to the U.S. Senate. So the requests of the contestees to stop this consideration by the U.S. Senate is simply unconstitutional and must be denied. My, con my contention to the U.S. Senate as a sole judge, despite the margin argument advanced by Senator Franken, is that Senator Franken's tactics, combined with the total annihilation of awareness of even existence of my campaign, hence annihilation, Latin root, nihil, or nothing, an annihilation he orchestrated in the media, relying on the FCC to permit him to totally eliminate me from any exposure of my ideas and also my answers from the absolutely false media attacks that began f days after I won the major pr uh, party primary. These have corrupted and polluted the purity of the 2014 U.S. Senate race in Minnesota. Viewed in this light, this body's interest in regulating and enforcing and judging the manner in which the state of Minnesota made this selection is paramount. Viewed in the totality of that election, a debate would have allowed me not only to advance my ideas and positions and contrast them with Senator Franken's, but also to deny Minnesota Public Radio's false allegations spread throughout the state and still on the internet that, I su that supposedly I said killing Trayvon Martin was a public service. False. What I did say is that George Zimmerman, by guarding his condominium and working with police to stop a rash of break-ins, uh, in the condominium performed a valuable public service. Minnesota Public Radio never recanted when, re, uh, when repeatedly to the author Tom Sheck I pointed this out in NPR's own Facebook citations. Sheck joked repeatedly, Facebook is forever. Minnesota Public Radio also recycled an old claim that I supported Todd Aiken's claims about rape and abortion because I said in a Minnesota Public Radio State Fair debate in 2012 that no one was saying rape is legitimate. 
These kinds of misrepresentations are vicious. And so this kind of war on tactics uh, were coordinated with Senator Franken's campaign. A Minnesota public radio event called a U.S. Senate debate was the denouement, the piece de resistance, and the coup de grace of this totally orchestrated campaign to look senatorial in the Fitzgerald Theater staged by this same Minnesota public radio who had agreed uh, this year to forego all state fair debates, substituting Amy Klobuchar instead, and drop state fair debates, which would have occurred just after the time Minnesota Public Radio helped Franken by spreading these vicious lies. The big publicity of disowning and vicious lies in the press happened just at the time of the first polls of the race, and so these polls must be discredited and cannot be used to infer that I was any kind of a fringe candidate. I was a major political party candidate who had debated with Representative McCollum repeatedly in broadcast debates with Teresa Collette, a member of the Supreme Court Bar and St. Thomas Law professor, and certainly uh, could debate with Bill Maher or Al Franken or any member of the SNL cast or DFL party. So the polls, the margin, are only one piece of the validity of this election, which I submit is what is before the U.S. Senate to decide. I'm Steve Carlson, the contestant and the nominee of the IP party for U.S. Senate, and this is part one. Uh, thank you for watching.